This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. It's lovely to see so many people here. Um, I should introduce myself. I'm Catherine Gilbert. I am the research officer in the new Centre for Postcolonial Studies that we have here at, at the School of Advanced Study. Um, and my own research actually looks at Rwandan women genocide survivor testimonies. So obviously, I was thrilled when I was when I was asked to chair this book launch um, for Jennifer. So I'm just going to say a few words about Jennifer. I won't talk much about the book itself because obviously I'll leave that for Jennifer herself. Um, So Dr. Jennifer Melvin is a lecturer in sociology and human rights at the University of Roehampton. Her research interests include genocide, post-conflict reconciliation, human rights protection and international development. And she completed her PhD in sociology here at the Human Rights Consortium in in 2012 under the direction of Dr. Damien Short, who is here in the audience. Um, <laughs> so she, Jennifer's conducted ethnographic research in the Great Lakes region of Africa, with a particular focus on Rwanda, and her research has been published in peer-reviewed journals, such as the Journal of Human Rights in the Commonwealth and the International Journal of Human Rights. Um, she's here today, then, to talk to us about her new monograph, Reconciling Rwanda, Unity, Nationality and State Control, which was published with the University of London Press in 2015 as part of the Critical Studies in Human Rights series. And I'd just like to say that you can pick up a copy for half price, just only for today, at our launch event, and you can get the author to sign it for you. So that's a special offer um, for the end of the talk. And the book has been praised as a significant contribution to understanding post-genocide politics in Rwanda and to scholarship on reconciliation and human rights more broadly. And it provides an important critical study of Rwanda's national unity and reconciliation programme and how it functions in social and political practice. So I'll now pass over to Jennifer, who's going to tell us a lot more about it. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Welcome to the launch of this book. Just real now, I can hold it, it's wonderful. Um, I'm really pleased to chat with you all um, about my experience conducting this research as well as the process of writing this book, um, and about my thoughts and reflections um, on Rwanda and the Great Lakes region more broadly. And I'm even more pleased to do it in this building where I was able to uh, finish my PhD. Um, such a beautiful and inspiring place to be to study human rights. But before I get started, I have a few thank yous um, to make. Um, and first and foremost, I'd like to thank Damien Short for most of the PhD process from which um, this book has arisen, it was just the two of us working together. And I can't think of a better mentor and friend to have done it with. Um, and a big thank you to um, those who read earlier versions of the work, um, who unfortunately are not here tonight, but there are quite a few people who gave me lots of support in editing. Um, thank you to the publication team um, for making the process really smooth, really easy, and making this look so good. It really does. I'm so, so pleased with it. Thank you to the Institute of Commonwealth Studies for hosting the event, as well as for well, hosting my PhD, I suppose. <laughs> what a fabulous place to study. Um, and thank you so much to those who left kind words on the back of the book, again, who are unfortunately not here tonight. Um, I'm very pleased to include Martin Short and Rebecca Tinsley's words on the back of the book. Um, and thank you to Jack and to both of our families, as well as our friends, for all the support throughout this long, long process. But now it's finished. <laughs> well, I could talk to you about the book. I was going to read a chapter. But you're all going to buy the book and read it anyways, so there's no point in me reading a chapter to you. So instead what I'll do is I'll talk to you about the research process, what it was like to actually conduct this research, analyze it, and some of my findings and interpretations um, that arise primarily from my fieldwork as well as from sort of subsequent analysis that has come more recently. So as most of you know, I'm sure in this room, Rwanda is a tiny landlocked country in the Great Lakes region of Africa. It's Africa's most densely populated country with a population over 12 million um, in 2015. Now this is a very, very densely populated country. Think about it being slightly larger than Wales and jamming in 12 million people. It's an incredibly tight feeling place. Um, Although there is a de facto ban um, which condemns the use of ethnic language in Rwanda, you can still roughly divide the population into the Hutu majority, Tutsi minority, and then the Twa, who are a group who consider themselves to be indigenous. There are three major languages in Rwanda, Kenya Rwanda, French, and most recently English, has been introduced as the language of education in 2009 um, when Rwanda joined the Commonwealth. So let's zoom out. Some of my colleagues will recognize this picture as I was testing their um, knowledge of African geography. They did very well on the test. Um, but it gives you an indication of just how tiny Rwanda is. If you can find it on the map there, I'm sure lots of you know where it is. But it also gives you an indication of 
which states surround it, which is incredibly important to Rwanda's history as well as to Rwanda's current development. So it's bordered by Tanzania, Burundi, Uganda, and very importantly, for my book at least, um, DR Congo. And I focus primarily on that relationship. Although in the question period, I'm more than happy to answer questions or chat about what's going on in Burundi at the moment as well. So that's also very important. But it's difficult to talk about Rwanda without discussing the genocide against the Tutsi. Um, and I won't focus on this for too long, um, but it is important to get a sense of where Rwanda is now. So if we look back um, at 1994, April 6th is an incredibly important day, um, the day in which uh, Rwanda's president, a man called Juvenal Habyarimana, was assassinated. Um, and he was assassinated along with Burundian president Cyprian Interamira while they were flying back from a diplomatic meeting in Arusha. Um, and their plane was shot down by a land-to-air missile. Some French dignitaries were also killed at the time. Within hours, the genocide started. So officially, April 7, 1994, <coughs> is marked as the beginning of the genocide. And this is when we see roadblocks being erected. This is when militia is supported by the government, um, walking around with names, uh, lists of names, um, search, pardon me, seeking out Tutsi to be assassinated and to be um, effectively wiped out in what very quickly um, became a genocide. Um, these acts were also perpetrated by regular civilians, um, primarily Hutu, um, but again, not all Hutu participated in the genocide by any means, um, as well as by military officials. I don't want to get into too much detail about the violence, because it is gruesome and it's gory and it's very challenging to listen to and to work on. Um, but effectively, I would argue that there are three distinguishing features of the violence. The first is a systematic nature. So these are um, lists of names. Um, these were prepared in advance. The roadblocks went in within hours um, of the plane having been shot down. Um, and we also see the use of ethnic identity cards um, to identify potential victims. The second feature is the brutal nature of the violence. Um, this wasn't long range missiles and guns uh, for the most part. This was farm, to okay. this is farm tools, this is clubs and machetes. Um, and it's very much close range violence. Um, and in some cases, this was neighbor on neighbor. Uh, there are many incidents um, recorded in which the, the victims who survived knew their attackers. Um, and also, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence of those who did not survive um, having known their assailants as well. The third feature would be the um, you know, absence of effective international response. I was, I was going to soften that, say, the almost absence, but not really, it's the absence. Um, and for anyone who studied Rhonda will know that really it was an utter and complete failure. Um, and in a letter dated the 16th of December, 1999, uh, former Secretary General Kofi Annan stated um, that the findings of an independent inquiry into UN action during the genocide found that international inaction took place because of a lack of will to take the commitment which would have been necessary to prevent or to stop the genocide. So the genocide did eventually stop um, about 100 days later, on the 4th of July, 1994. And it was stopped by the RPF, or the Rwandan Patriotic Front, or the current government, and have been in power effectively since the end of the genocide. And I'll come to the fact that I said effectively um, in a few minutes. Um, but uh, ultimately, they were left with the challenge of rebuilding the country um, from July 4th, which is recognized as Liberation Day. And everything was destroyed. It's, it's almost impossible to imagine it from afar seeing infrastructure being wiped out, a health crisis, where you have people who have survived attacks, amputations, women, scores of women who've been raped, um, as well as sanitation being wiped out, what little sanitation there was, um, housing crisis. Um, we have survivors um, who have been pushed out of their houses, coming home when the house is either destroyed or has been seized, um, as well as almost total absence of law and order. We have judges and lawyers who fled um, or actually participated in the genocide as well as the participation of police. Emotionally, things were also in complete tatters. We see families destroyed, communities ripped apart. Um, much of the violence um, for which we have evidence demonstrates again that people knew each other, but sometimes they knew each other very intimately. So we have evidence of um, husbands murdering their wives, um, neighbors who had had long-term relationships um, turning on each other. And ultimately, this, there's also a breakdown in trust in the state. So it can be an incredibly difficult thing to rebuild. When your government launches a genocide against the people, um, starting again, even if it's with a new government, is incredibly, incredibly challenging. <clears throat> From here, it's important to get a sense of the Rwanda Patriotic Front, um, or the RPF, as I'll refer to them. Um, they were a rebel group of Tutsi refugees who had fled Rwanda for Uganda 
uh, during a period of anti-Tutsi violence between 1959 and 1967. So they had been living in Uganda um, throughout this period, and they formed the RPF in 1987 to create democracy and to bring refugees home. So there had been a mass exodus of about 200,000 Tutsi um, in that seven-year period, um, and lots of them were in Uganda and were unable to go back. Um, and they invaded Uganda to attempt to promote these ideals, purportedly to bring democracy and to bring refugees home, and they did this on the 1st of October 1990, which was Ugandan Independence Day. This invasion was incredibly destabilizing, um, and it led to a four-year-long civil war, which invigorated anti-Tutsi rhetoric and ideology, as well as anti-RPF propaganda, which then fueled the genocide. Um, ultimately, the genocide reached on for those 100 days, as I've mentioned, um, but the RPF proved to be a stronger military force, um, and they ended the genocide by seizing the capital on the 4th of July 1994, which is commemorated as Liberation Day, as I mentioned. By the 19th of July, just, just over two weeks later, Rwanda had a relatively well-functioning government. It was a transitional government, granted, um, that was set up through a power-sharing agreement with the RPF, um, and it functioned well enough to start putting the state back together. Ultimately, as you see in the book, as well in other um, historical analysis of this, um, this government of national unity, the transitional government that you see up on the slide there, was run by the RPF. They had uh, the predominant amount of control within it, but it was a government that functioned nonetheless, and a government that was obliged to start putting the country back together. So this is where my research starts. My work is post-94, looking at the construction and dissemination of this form of national unity and reconciliation that I'll start talking about very shortly. I wanted to understand how a country could possibly come to grips with this kind of experience and how it could be rebuilt. It just seemed beyond Herculean to me um, that this could happen, particularly for a political party um, that originated as an invading, destabilizing, violent non-state actor to then be rebuilding this state. Also, this party's origins is in its members' own experience um, of having fled systematic violence having survived the civil war and the genocide. Ultimately, I also wanted to understand the, what I would say is a more challenging task of rebuilding relationships, rebuilding trust in communities, and ultimately rebuilding a relationship between the people and the state. So a bit more background um, and context. Reconciliation, that I'll be talking about shortly, was a dirty word in Rwanda in sort of the mid-1990s. For Tutsi survivor groups, it was synonymous with amnesty and the type that we would see in the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, but it was ultimately a dirty word for the transitional government as well, who saw it as a form of power sharing um, with Hutu opponents um, or those who participated in the genocide. But by the 1990s, um, Renchens and Vandigans um, argued that the government had created a comfortable enough environment to start pursuing some form of reconciliation. They'd effectively neutralized the risk of attack from inside and outside of the country, um, and Hutu political opponents um, had either fled or been arrested. So the GNU, under the power of the RPF, um, was ready to design and pursue its own vision of national unity and reconciliation. So this is what I really, at the heart of what I really wanted to understand. What is this form of national unity and reconciliation? How did they create it? How did they disseminate it? How did it impact people's lives? I can't even begin to fathom sort of the vastness of this um, project or the vastness of this desire um, to bring people back together. So my research questions that feature in the book um, effectively spell out this way. So how does the RPF government understand and disseminate this vision of national reconciliation? How does the RPF's singular narrative of the country's history, of which there is only one, there's one way that the genocide happened and how it impacted people and how that's going to impact Rwanda's future. Um, and also, how does the National Unity and Reconciliation Program function in social and political practice? Which is a fancy way of saying, how did it impact people's political lives? How did it impact the social landscape? What did it do to people's relationships? And ultimately, what did it do to the economy, which is something I can talk about a little bit later on. So, on to the research. I conducted an ethnographic study in Rwanda in 2009 and again in 2010. I was in the country for just over about five months. I was living in Kigali, in the capital, um, in a neighborhood called Kimihurura, and from there I would travel out um, all over the country to conduct this participant observation. Now, there's no official national unity and reconciliation program. Um, I refer to it that way because it really is um, quite a few separate projects um, and policies and programs um, that when they come together, they can be seen to promote um, national unity, national reconciliation, and ultimately national identity. 
Um, so I went to any and all events related to unity and reconciliation that I could find across the country. Anything that had a statement about identity, anything that had a statement about reconciliation, you name it, I went to it. So for most of these projects, um, they range from uh, Gachacha Genocide Courts, which I'll talk about very shortly, to Tige, um, which is the Cabo de Antenas General, which is just community service. You can hear my horrible French accent throughout this, I apologize. Um, I went to Engando camps or civic education camps um, and had multiple meetings in uh, the Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Finance, um, and ultimately visited uh, DDR, or as my students who just come in will know, that is uh, demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration, as you've been tested on it many times uh, in class. Um, and I wanted to get a sense of how these programs worked individually and then how they came together to form or promote some vision of national unity and reconciliation. Um, and I also conducted semi-structured interviews with the people who ran these projects. And later on, I'm happy to talk about some of the challenges of doing that. Um, and then, in addition to that, I conducted thematic analysis of government documentation about this program. So, um, presidential speeches, of which there are numerous, um, legislation, the policies around these kinds of programs. So here's a taste of some of the places I went. Uh, for some of you, this picture will be familiar, I'm sure. Um, this is an image from Gachacha, the genocide courts that were taking place um, in Rwanda until they shut in 2012. Gachacha are grassroots courts that heard cases of crimes of genocide and crimes against humanity that were committed between October 1990 and December 1994. Um, the courts were up and running from 2005 until 2012. So in that seven year period, they heard upwards of two million cases. Incredibly interesting, dynamic um, program um, guided by stated commitments to speed justice, eradicate impunity, promote um, reconciliation, and demonstrate that Rwanda can solve its own problems. This particular picture I took um, at um, a case that had 15 defendants um, who were referred to as masterminds, so those who um, had either planned acts of genocide or who were in leadership positions in their own communities and had not stopped the genocide um, or had actually incited some kind of violence. Um, you can see the judges in the background, of which there are nine on each bench, um, and this is one of the defendants. Those who have, are in Gatacha in many cases um, will wear the pink uniform, um, and then once they've been sent to jail, they continue to wear this pink jumper, and it is to separate them from the rest of the prison population who wear orange. Um, it was an incredibly dynamic experience to follow these cases. I followed a few all the way through to the appeal stage. I wanted to get a sense of how the courts work in rural areas and in urban areas, um, as well as um, the impact of people's lives, what the verdicts were, how things worked. From there, I went to community service camps, or TIGE camps. I won't go through the French again, but save myself uh, some embarrassment. Um, this is one of those camps. Uh, so if you were a category two perpetrator, so someone who had um, used violence with the intention of killing someone, or had actually killed someone, um, and you pled guilty, you could end up in one of these camps for part of your sentence. And the idea here was that this would provide some form of reparation um, to the victims, but also it would help to rehabilitate or reintegrate uh, the perpetrator once they were released. And they would work on projects like road building, they would carry water for survivors, um, and they would ultimately they would engage with the community relatively. They were still pretty protected and pretty hidden away. They also received classes about unity and reconciliation, classes about history, um, and kind of how to reintegrate afterwards. Um, so classes about hygiene and things like that. But I realized that, um, in visiting this particular camp that it was set up very close to a resettlement area for genocide survivors. Um, so I asked um, the program manager, I was like, that's not even strange if you have category two uh, perpetrators um, in this camp and they're you know, effectively within spitting distance of a community of survivors, surely there must be some tension, you know, how are people engaging with each other? And he said to quote, um, he had never seen peasants throwing rocks at TGs um, so these people in the community camps, or TGs using machetes to kill people on the outside. So everything was working well, and mm -hmm. reconciliation was happening. This is an Engando camp, so a civic education camp. Um, I visited these over several days um, in northwestern Rwanda. Um, so this is an education camp for students entering university, but Engando and Ijerero camps, which I can talk about a little bit more later, um, educate uh, a large number of different types of people. So community uh, workers, commercial sex workers, uh, older people, younger people, people going into university, um, perpetrating these kinds of things that can be sent through those two types of camps. 
And Gando, um, at the time, was focusing primarily on teaching people about unity and reconciliation. It was very much a solidarity camp um, in that particular sense. And when I visited, um, there were hundreds of students attending these courses. Um, and it looks like there's actually soldiers running with guns in this picture, right? It's not. It's students going, sort of 17, 18 year olds in um, RDF or military uniforms carrying bowls and running to lunch. <laughs> it's quite a strange image. They're carrying wooden sticks as well to represent guns. Um, but it was one of the most interesting and enticing environments to learn about Rwandan history. One of the very few places where students learn about it. Um, this was a place that was filled with song, filled with excitement, um, and some of the um, conversations I had with participants, you know, it's the first time they get to hold hands with their girlfriend, it's the first time they're away from home, it's a very exciting place. And they learn about the RPF's vision of unity and reconciliation, which is very particular, we'll talk about shortly. They learn about the one version of Rhonda's history, and they learn about development, and they learn about um, how the country is progressing and how good things are at the moment. Um, but on the flip side, how bad ethnicity is and how horrible colonialism was for Rwanda as well. Throughout this period, um, I also visited a number of commemoration sites. Um, the most high profile, I suppose, being um, Amahoro. Um, I was in Rwanda um, for the 15th anniversary of the genocide, and I stayed for the 100 days. So there's officially one week of mourning that runs from April 7th to April 14th. I stayed for the, the full 100. Um, but there's a lot of different commemoration sites and events that were happening, particularly during that one first week. Um, uh, this one comes from an area close to Nianza. This is from Eto, if anyone's familiar with the story of Ecole Technique Officielle and the pulling out um, of peacekeepers. Um, I also visited Morandi on several occasions um, to get a sense of how memory is used, how narrative around um, healing is used, um, and whether or not um, the people who visited these sites, Rondans felt that they were helpful or that they made a connection themselves uh, between these sites, unity and reconciliation. Uh, this is a picture of a DDR camp. Um, I also visited these camps. Uh, so these are former FDLR soldiers who had been captured by UN forces in the Kivu provinces um, and then had been brought back into Rwanda to be repatriated as well as reintegrated, demobilized, all of those things. Um, and I visited this camp because I wanted to understand how reconciliation and unity was being taught to them. Because I was interested to see whether or not it was different from the Ngando camps and from all the literature about Iterero and about um, history education um, during that time period. Um, and ultimately it was being taught very much the same way. Same history, same singular narrative, same vision of national unity and reconciliation. But they were also being taught about how to take out a bank loan, how to reintegrate, how to um, buy a house, all these different things. Very interesting. Ultimately, um, quite a few members of the FDLR um, had actually participated during the genocide before they fled to Zaire and now DR Congo. Um, but the, the ex-combatants who come through this camp were not trying to get Chacha courts. That was part of the arrangement. If they would come back, even though they were captured, um, that they would not have to go through the Chacha court system. And lastly, um, I attended the, uh, several events in the run-up to the 2010 presidential election, um, during which uh, President Kigami was re-elected amid accusations of fraud, intimidation, and political assassinations. Um, and I thought that this was important to understanding the RPS vision of national unity and reconciliation, because ultimately, they're the unifying force. It's their program, it's top-down, um, and they are the party of the people. And part of this comes from that de facto ban on ethnic identities. They're no longer the party of the Tutsi, they're the party of all Rwanda, the Banyar Rwanda, the people. Making President Kigami the president of the people. Um, and they do enjoy popular support. Again, something we can talk about afterwards, I'm more than happy, um, particularly given the referendum in 2015, in December 2015 rather, um, that will extend President Kigami's um, presidency to allow him to run um, for a third term in 2017, followed by two subsequent five-year terms um, starting thereafter. And this received approval from 98.3% of those who turned up to vote. Um, in terms of this particular election, um, it was a very interesting and challenging time to do research. And I'm happy to talk about that at the end as well. Um, in terms of keeping things updated, um, it's been 
it's been a long road and it's been a very interesting one. Because um, it has been a while since I conducted this research. Uh, but I've effectively kept it up to date by staying on top of government documents, presidential speeches, reports from RPF controlled media, primarily the New Times, as well as conducting participant observation at different RPF events in London, attending several speeches with President Paul Kagame, um, as well as other members of the RPF government. Um, and where President Kagame goes, Congolese anti Kagame protesters also go. Um, so I've had several meetings with them, as well as ongoing interviews with RPF dissidents to see whether or not this vision has changed over time, is it still active, how is it being used in political discourse. So my analysis throughout this book, it's still funny to pick it up and hold it, but in this book, um, is driven primarily by social constructionism, because um, I was interested in the construction of the words, the concepts um, that inform national reconciliation as well as the ideologies, and then how they are disseminated. Um, and the framework of social constructionism allowed me to develop a nuanced theoretical and empirical understanding of this program, particularly the power dynamics as well as the stated commitments made by the RPF and the political interests that inform all elements of, this different, um, of those projects within this program. So the book compares those different projects within the National Unity and Reconciliation Program against the project's own, or pardon me, the program's own internal logic. Um, international human rights okay. <laughs> international human rights standards um, that Rhonda has signed and ratified, as well as the theory and practice of reconciliation as a peacemaking paradigm. And to understand reconciliation, I drew heavily on John Paul Lederach's work, um, which is understanding reconciliation as a creation of space for mercy and the understanding of subjective experiences of harm according to those who have harmed and those who were harmed. Um, I also drew on David A. Crocker's work about reconciliation, his spectrum of thin to thick, um, understandings of the term. So the thinnest end, just not killing each other, all the way up to the thickest end that we see more closely reflected in uh, the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Commission, devotion to love, devotion to forgiveness, and rebuilding the country. Ultimately, my findings um, were surprising. Um, it, I determined that three major themes emerge from the work um, that I had done in the country as well as remotely. And these three major themes are justice, nation building, and their victor's narrative, which is the term I've given that singular version of history, the one way to understand history in Rwanda. Um, and the book examines how these themes relate to the changing political interests, as well as conceptions of unity, identity, and national reconciliation as defined by the RPF. And it argues ultimately that the National Unity and Reconciliation Program is far from an exercise in equality um, or open engagement in the legacies of past violence. Instead, it serves two purposes. The first is to project interrelated images of Rwanda as well as the RPF. Um, and one of these images is projected to the domestic audience um, that demonstrates that the country is safe, it's stable, um, and that it's developing very rapidly. Not untrue by any means. Um, and the second is projected to the international community. And this is shaped by the RPF's relationship with the international community of donors, investors, neighboring countries, and international organizations. Um, and ultimately, this image attracts donorship, attracts investment, and it quashes criticism um, of the RPF um, and its actions during the Civil War from 1990 to 1994, as well as its action during the genocide its interventions in DRC, as well as accusations of human rights violations in Rwanda today. Now, having been very pessimistic for the last few minutes, um, I say there's still value in reconciliation amidst these problems. Much of the value stems from the individual ingredients that inform the RPF's vision of national reconciliation, as well as value in the broader concept in the literature. Is that reconciliation is still a useful paradigm for understanding how individuals, groups, communities, and nations rebuild and move forward after war and after genocide. Speaking and hearing the truth, providing justice for survivors and victims, building the country, how all have moral and legal import after violence. Although I argue that we should always be skeptical, and we should be skeptical of the political interests, dynamics, and actions that guide how reconciliation programs are constructed and how they're implemented. With this in mind, my analysis um, of social and political functions leads to a conclusion that the RPF's official reconciliation program, its national unity and reconciliation program, ought to be understood as a nation-building and state legitimization project 
that secures the political dominance of the RPF and President Paul Kagame. Thank you very much. <laughs>